a with a thought back to Psalm 19 again. This time, verse 9. Up to this point, he's been talking about, he talked about the law of the Lord or the law of Yahweh, the testimony, the precepts, the commandment. And now he throws in something that seems odd at first, at least to me, um, because it doesn't, it's not, doesn't seem to be parallel with those others. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. The fear of the Lord, uh, I, I think the way that that comes in here is we, one of the reasons we are, we are and should be devoted to him is out of the fear of the Lord, out of the fear of Yahweh. Now, fear has gotten kind of a bad rap because um, at one time, probably there was too much, too much emphasis on the fear of the Lord and too much em Somehow we 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 got this picture of um, um, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and so, uh, and I think there were generations of people that had this picture of God wanting to throw them in hell sooner than look at them. Okay, yeah, a lot of us were raised with that that kind of thing, and so we hear the fear of the Lord. And people do a double take, and sometimes I've heard people say, well, that's an Old Testament idea, not a New Testament idea. Not true. Read the book of Revelation, and it talks about the fear of the Lord, and there are other places in the New Testament as well. So whatever it is, it's not simply something bygone, of a bygone era. Um, but at the same time, we, we have to see it, I think, as it is. The fear of the Lord, we, sometimes that has been translated, has been described as respect. And my problem, my only problem with that is I'm not sure that that's strong enough. There is a sense of fear when we come to God and we come when we come to the word of God because we realize that our total well-being, our life, and our total well-being is in his hands. Only a fool wouldn't wouldn't give ultimate respect to one who who has their total well-being in his hands. And uh, and yet it, at the same time, it's not the idea. I th think we have to hold that in balance with not only are we to fear God, but we're to love Him and know that. Our love for him is simply, as C.S. Lewis said, on, on the whole, it's safer to speak of God's love for us than our love for him. Our love for him is, is a love that responds to his love for us. And so on the one hand, we recognize that God loves us more deeply than anyone has ever loved us. And on the other hand, we fear him because we recognize that our total well-being our total well-being is in his hands. An illustration of that, that I think, at least for me, it, it brought it across. There was a teacher in a school that I once attended who, uh, who had two daughters. And one day he was driving with one of his daughters in the car. And as they were driving along, he said, um, he said, are you ever afraid of me? And she said, oh, daddy. And then she thought for just a moment, and she said, well, sometimes. And he said, then consider the fear of God. Now, what was going on there, I think, was the reason she said, oh, daddy, to start with, was because she knew her, she knew her daddy loved her. Loved her very deeply and wanted her well-being and wanted what was good for her. But at the same time, she realized sometimes he was really angry because of things that she did, and sometimes it was even frightening to her. And I think with with God, we need to have uh, hold those two things in a sense in tension. He loves us more deeply than anyone has ever loved us, and at the same time, we should fear him because we know of his power, and we know of his righteousness, and we know that we, within ourselves, 
don't match up well to that righteousness. The g- good news for us is we receive a righteousness that's not our own in Jesus Christ. He imputes his righteousness into us. And when God the Father sees us, he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not through our own miserable failure to be as righteous as we should be. Uh, so I hope I hope that is helpful. But when we when we come to the word of God, again, I think we hold those two things in tension. We know that God loves us, and we should never, ever take that for granted. And at the same time, we recognize that he is the almighty, all holy, righteous God, and that we can never take him for granted or never pretend as if what we do doesn't matter. Okay, now let's continue with what we've been doing, um, what we started uh, in the past. And um, this is... Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Before you start? Sure. Uh, when is Obadiah due? What do you mean? Oh, that, that was due... It's due tomorrow. It is due tomorrow? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Now, by the way, I'm glad you brought that up. I will I will accept papers late. They lose something. They lose something in the grade if they're late, but I will accept them late. Don't don't be discouraged if you're if you're late. I'm I'm not going to kill you because you're late and I'm not going to reject your paper because you're late. But uh b- because the reason I did these exercises, I, I sort of uh, debated what was the best way to to handle the material, and I decided that giving the exercises gives you a chance to work with these texts. And, and you'll notice I started out with two one-chapter books because those are easier to handle. If I'd given you Isaiah, you'd say, ah! <laughs> Rightly so. <laughs> and a week wouldn't be enough. <laughs> but but in giving you one, I was trying to give you something that's manageable and so and, and books so that you could see the whole picture of them. And um so yeah, I'm glad you I let, glad you brought that up because I meant to I mentioned meant to mention that because I think some people have become discouraged because um they didn't get them in on time and and think that I won't accept them, but I will. Okay, thank you. Okay, last week, let me, let me remind you of the two-step process of this in-depth Bible study. And I will say, this is, um, the way I teach this is pretty rigorous. I mean, it's, but in defense of being rigorous. <laughs> um, if some of it just seems too much, it'll, it'll get easier as we go along. And when we turn to the other books, you'll find, you'll find help. But remember, there's this two-step process. We study without the help of any other books except a Bible and a concordance. And, we, and, and then after we've done that, we turn to other books. So then we study with the help of other books, but I keep it in that order. I think at some point in my life, I went to the other books first. And um, I'll say a little bit about that. And I, the, the problem with that is we're letting them decide what it means. We're letting them give us the interpretation and they may be right or they may not be right, but whatever it is, we're not struggling with the text ourselves. And I'm I'm a great believer, tremendous believer, that the clues to understanding the books of the Bible are within those books. And are there other things that will help in certain ways? Yes. But but those books were written to be understood. <clears throat> yeah. I just want to add to you, for you, in the class, um, I'm putting together a Bible study lesson for this Sunday, 
and this coming Sunday. And I used your approach as opposed to my normal way of doing it, um, going through this two-step process. And um, it was very eye-opening to me. Um, I don't know if my lesson's going to be any better or worse, but for me personally, I walked away with a different perspective, a whole different feeling. Um, so, yeah, I'm just starting with this process, but it was uh, very beneficial, I feel. Now, again, I don't know what the result of the lesson's going to be like, but for me personally, it was uh, very rewarding to do it that way. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for giving me that uh, testimonial. Um, I, I right now I'm I'm also I'm teaching a Sunday morning class um, on Colossians, and this is this is my approach, and um, I fa have found myself finding things in Colossians. I I don't know how many times I've studied Colossians, read Colossians, studied it. And um, but I'm finding things in it that I've ne never saw before. And it's because I'm concentrating on the text. I'm concentrating on the wording of the text and asking questions, sometimes questions I can't answer. <laughs> but but it, it's good for me. And and you've uh, you found the same thing. So good. OK, let's continue. Well, before we talked about the uh, approaching the text like a detective or an investigative reporter, about reading and rereading the text, about asking the reporters questions, who, what, when, where, why, how. And before that, there were other things that we mentioned. Um, when, we, when we come to the text, one of the things that we should look for is... Uh, how do I want to put it? We just put it in the background. We realize it's there. It's the type of literature that we're dealing with, the genre. Genre is a fancy word just for type of literature. And you'll see it in, in different things. The Bible, in one sense, is one book with a theme that starts in Genesis and ends in the book of Revelation. And with Jesus Christ as the pinnacle of of the whole narrative. It's one book with one major theme that runs through it. But in another sense, it's a library of books. 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Some of the ones in the Old Testament, you can quibble about it a little bit because apparently 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles were each one book, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles at one time. But still, it's a library, and it's just like you going to a library or reading different kinds of books. You expect different things from those books when you read them. For instance, if you pick up a history book, History of the United States, you expect certain things. Um, you expect it to be factually accurate. If it's not, you say, what? He's off on this. Uh, but you, but what you expect is it's going to be factually accurate and it's going to tell you it's going to tell you the actual history. On the other hand, if you pick up a book of poetry, you're not looking for factual accuracy. You're looking for visionary, emotional, sometimes emotional. The, the emotion may be laughter or it may be tears, but it's usually very often there's some emotion in it. And it doesn't function in the same way as history. Are you following me? Does this make sense? This isn't just in the Bible. It's any any time we would pick up literature, we realize this. Or let's say you pick up a biography. That's history, but it's history of a certain kind, history of an individual. And again, we expect it to be factual, but we also expect it to zero in on the person and the period in which they lived. Or you read um, in the Bible, well, you have both of those in the Bible, history, biography, 
all three, I guess, uh, biography and uh, poetry. You also have Proverbs. Every, <clears throat> as far as I know, every society has some Proverbs. And the ancient world was no exception. You can find ancient books of Egyptian Proverbs, of Assyrian and Babylonian Proverbs. They all had Proverbs, and there's a book of Proverbs in the Bible. Now, one of the distinctions between the book of Proverbs in the Bible and these other books of Proverbs is the book of Proverbs in the Bible is consciously God-centered. Consciously centered on the one true God. These other books you'll find are, are bits of practical wisdom, but they're not God-centered. Um, I mean, Proverbs, Proverbs says at the very beginning that the... Uh, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, we, we come back to the idea of the fear of the Lord, but, but that that's the beginning. Uh, there's the beginning point for understanding wisdom. And in the book of Proverbs, we have that we find that wisdom is both godly and practical. In these other books, it doesn't have the same emphasis. And yet when you read a proverb, you're reading something different from poetry, something different from history. Or you go to the Song of Songs, known as Song of Solomon commonly. Um, that's love poetry. The the rabbis had a problem with that because they couldn't they couldn't get their minds around the idea that there'd be love poetry in the Bible. But I believe that's exactly what it is, and they allegorized it, and I think it was the wrong thing to do with it. Uh, it it shows. Uh, love between the love that should be between husband and wife or you go to ecclesiastes and you have a different kind of literature again where someone is struggling with the meaning of life or you go to the prophets prophets had a, a specific kind of literature that's a bit different than any other literature that we have um there is some there are some historical elements there are some, at times some symbolic um, elements um, sometimes there are future elements they're predicting they're prophesying the future and and there's an awful lot in the prophets that has to do with the present it's more like preaching where the, where they talk about the 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 state of the current state of society and how they've wandered from God. Something I read years ago that has stuck with me, and I think it's absolutely true, it was about Amos, but it applies, I think, to all the prophets. He said Amos was a man of the old way. He wasn't some radical uh, charting a new path, but he was actually a man who was calling Israel back to the law of Moses, to the word of God. But again, that's a that's a certain kind of literature. You come to the New Testament, already mentioned biography. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are biographies. Uh, Acts is not a biography, but it is history, narrative history. Then you go beyond that and you get into letters. Again, if you pick up a letter, you expect certain things in a letter. You expect some, maybe some personal thoughts, and depending on the relationship between the writer and the and the recipient, uh, you're going to have um, you you may have advice that's being given or whatever. But again, you you see that in letters. Um, we come finally to. Uh, well, before we get there, we go to Hebrews, and Hebrews, I believe, is a sermon. It's a very long sermon, but I believe it has all the marks of a sermon. And when you hear the writer saying, let us, that's a sort of exhortation that you'd expect in a first century sermon. Let us go on to better things. Then we come to the book of Revelation, and Revelation is apocalyptic literature 
It's very visionary. There's nothing that is quite like it today. In some ways, it would almost be like it would almost be like fantasy literature, but it's not fantasy. But it uses symbolic language. There are some parallels to Revelation in the book in the Old Testament, for instance, in Ezekiel and Daniel. And I believe Daniel actually is kind of the model for the book of Revelation in many ways. But what I'm saying is it's important to know what kind of literature you're dealing with when you, when you come to it, because each one of them is different. And the expectation, because the expectation is different, the way we deal with the literature is different. The way you deal with history is different from the way you deal with poetry. Um, Am I making sense? Talk to me. I'm getting a thumbs up, and maybe some of you are talking, but you're muted. <laughs> so if you want to say something, unmute. But uh, uh, th that, by the way, that's the reason why at the beginning of the course, I recommended two books. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Fee and Stewart and uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Both of them do a really good job of talking about how you interpret different kinds of literature. Now, there are some principles that apply to all, but there are some principles that you, that you need to keep in mind for specific kinds of literature. And um, this is the reason. And, it, and it's, it's exciting. But it's even more complicated than I talked about. For instance, in the Gospels, you have um, you have parables. Parables are a unique kind of literature within themselves. They're what are they? They're not history. They're not. They didn't necessarily happen, but they're true to life. Uh, a man had a hundred sheep and he lost one. That, that's not a totally outlandish idea. It's not fantasy, fanciful. Um, it's something that could happen in the real world. Or, you know, you have a woman who lost a coin. That's real world stuff. Um, so each, each kind of literature, it's good to keep it in mind because the way we approach it will be different. And we expect different things from it because it's different. Okay, next, look for themes. Look for themes in the book you are studying. And um, these themes can, can come to us in different ways. But something I have found in my own study that I think is one of the, one of the most important, one of the most important things that I've discovered, and that is the importance of repeated words and phrases, repeated words and phrases within a document. Now, the, there's a there's a reason for the, for this. In English, in English, we have a very rich vocabulary as far as synonyms. So, for instance, we don't have one word for rabbit, rabbit, bunny cottontail, jackrabbit, and you could go on and on and on, hare. And probably most of you were taught when you're writing or speaking, use a variety of those words. It gets boring if you just use the same thing over and over again, so use a variety. Um, the Hebrews and the Greeks had a more limited vocabulary. It's a very rich vocabulary, but it, they didn't have all the synonyms. They did have some synonyms, but not as many as we have. And so one of the ways that both, that we, it's across the board throughout the Bible. One of the ways that the writers emphasize something is by repeating it. And the repeated, and it may be one word, repeated or it may be a phrase and it's repeated for emphasis 
Now it, it can function in different ways and we'll, we'll come to some of it later. It can be used as a marker. Um, it can it can be used as a marker for uh, structure. And like I said, we'll, we'll have more to say about that later. But uh, right now I'm emphasizing themes. So for instance, in the Old Testament book of Joel, Joel's three chapters, five times in the three chapters, Joel uses the phrase, the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord. Five times in three chapters. Now, if you think about it, that's a that's a pretty that must be pretty important uh, uh, to use it that many times. But he's repeating it, and there's a reason why he's repeating it. There's there's emphasis on it. Or in Isaiah, he uh, and this is somewhat unique. I'm not saying it doesn't appear anywhere else, but it's chiefly in Isaiah. He refers to God as the Holy One of Israel, and he does it throughout the book. Um, in uh, John, which you'll find me coming back to John. That's one of my favorites. But the Gospel of John, John is rich in themes. And these themes are seen in repeated words like truth, light, love, um, and darkness as the kind of the counterpoint to, to light. Um, light and darkness. Um, abide. And, and yes. What was that? Abide. Abide. That's another one. And these repeated words and phrases may be repeated throughout the book, or they may be repeated in one section of the book. And you're right. Abide. Abide is one of them. But John is rich with these. He's just got so many of them. And um, I mentioned life, life and eternal life in John are the same thing. And it, it, that it's definitely something that's that's repeated. Um, in um, in the Gospels. And sometimes I think we're so used to reading certain things that we don't think about how much it's being emphasized by the way it's repeated. For instance, sometime when you're reading any book of the Bible, notice how often God is repeated. Or Lord. In the Gospels, Jesus is a whole described in a whole variety of ways, but the same same word or phrases are very often used. He is Lord, Savior, Christ, Jesus, and, and combinations of those. He is uh, son of God, son of man, son of David, and so on. And some of those are emphasized more in one gospel than in another. Most of them appear in all the gospels, but, but certain gospels uh, emphasize them more. Uh, I have a question about son of man. I'll be happy to say something about that. Son of man, I, I used to take son of man as being simply, you know, he's the son of God, he's son of man. So he's perfectly God, he's perfectly man. But I, I believe there's a, and that's true, but I believe there's something more there. If you go back to Daniel chapter 7, and uh, Daniel has parallels. There's a ch parallel between 2 and 7, 3 and 6 four and five. If you look at them, those are paired. So, so that there are certain themes that keep coming up. But in chapter seven, Daniel has a vision. And in this vision, the first part of chapter seven, there are these beasts, these wild beasts that, that come up uh, out of the sea. And, um, they symbolize beastly kingdoms, okay? They're human kingdoms, but they're beastly because they're out of control, they're violent, they're vicious. Then in contrast to that, you've got the Ancient of Days, which is a word that Daniel uses for God. You've got the Ancient of Days, and he is enthroned and surrounded 
by his entourage of elder of uh, angels. Then before him appears one like a son of man who comes with the clouds of heaven. For the longest time I read that son of man, okay, son of man. That appears in the New Testament too. Um, but th there's something interesting about it. Son of man would emphasize that he's a man. I mean, the son of a man's a man, right? <laughs> but he comes with the clouds of heaven. Throughout the Old Testament, it is God who comes with the clouds of heaven. So this son of man is not only a man, he's also deity. And he is given a kingdom that is everlasting and universal. And I believe in the New Testament when Jesus and Jesus' favorite designation of himself. And I favorite may be the wrong term to use, but it, it's favorite in the sense of the one he used most. His favorite designation was son of man. And I believe it's a reference to Daniel. And and in Daniel, you have not only that he is. God in the flesh, well, you have both God in the flesh, but the emphasis isn't just that he's human. If you go back to Daniel, he's both. And it also says something about his the kingdom that he that he came to set up. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's 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 an incredible picture of our Savior. And um, so when when you see Son of Man throughout the New Testament, think think about Daniel. Think about Daniel 7. Okay, so um, let me see. What else do I want to use? Do I need? Do you need any other illustrations of, as far as repeated words and phrases? You can do. Oh well, no, I will say a little bit more about it. Not so much an illustration. Um, maybe I will give an illustration. At one time, I was I was working on um, a lesson on uh, John fourteen, verse six. Where Jesus says, "I am the way and the truth and the life. No man goes to the comes to the Father but by me." Way, truth, life. Truth and life are two major themes in in John, in the Gospel of John. You don't have to go outside. In fact, I would encourage you not to go outside John for those themes. John is rich with those two themes throughout the book. Way is not. And I was puzzled over this. Why? I mean, the two are obviously repeated for emphasis. And what I, the conclusion I came to and uh, was that way, rather than being a repeated word, isn't repeated. It's pretty much unique in that in in that John fourteen. And what I decided was John's emphasizing it by doing the very opposite with it. He emphasizes truth and life by, by picking out two of his themes that say something about Jesus. It's not just that he teaches truth, but he is truth. Truth in a person. It isn't just that he gives you life. He is life. Uh, and I believe he emphasizes way. He is the way to the truth and the life and the way to the Father. And he emphasizes that by the very fact that it's so unique anyway that was my conclusion but what i have found if you start reading something and i mentioned that I, i've been teaching uh leading a actually a, leading a small group discussion on colossians and um and in looking at themes and in imagining what was going on in Colossae. I call it historical imagination. It's not just imagination running wild and believing anything, but it's bounded by history. And what I what what I got a picture of there was the church in Colossae was a church that was not planted by Paul. He had heard about them from the church planter, who was a man by the name of Epaphras. They were in an unfriendly society. We should be able to relate to that, where the Jews hated them because they saw them as apostates and teaching a false messiah. So the Jews were against them. The pagans were also against them 
for a different reason. They didn't think they were teaching a false messiah. They just thought they were crazy. And uh, outside the New Testament, we find that they were that Christians were eventually accused of atheism. Now you may say, what? Why, how could you possibly accuse a Christian of atheism? Well, you have to understand the culture. The culture was there are all these gods, and we're very tolerant of anybody who believes in all the gods. You can be devoted to any one of them, and we're fine with that. Be be devoted to Epaphroditus, or uh, not Epaphroditus, um, Apollo, or Zeus, or... Uh, Athena or whoever, be devoted to anyone you want to be, but you can't deny the existence of the others. And Christians were saying, there's one true God and the others don't exist. They're atheists. <laughs> Unbelievers. So, and the, the, the pagan Gentiles also hated the Christians because they were different. I mean, the, these people who turned on them were their neighbors, business associates, friends, relatives. You used to go out and party with us. You used to go to the temple of Aphrodite. You don't anymore. What's the matter with you? Okay. Um, if you've ever had, if if you if you lived a non-Christian life and you became a Christian and you found that some of your old friends turned against you because you were a Christian, not because you did anything bad to them. You can relate to what was going on there. And so what, what I began thinking was, okay, how would Paul approach these people who are fairly new Christians? The whole world is against them, it seems, and there are some false teachers out there. And I won't go into all that. Some people say they're Jews. Some people say they're pagan Gnostics. I I take the position that they were uh, syncretistic, that they had combined a little Judaism and a little Christianity and a little paganism into a weird, really weird mix. And again, we should be able to relate to that. People do that today. Um, but I imagine, what, what would you do? And... What I th think Paul does in reading Colossians and looking at it closely, he realized that no matter what the assault on Christianity, it was against Jesus, and it was saying he was not enough. The false teachers, without saying it, were saying he's not enough. You need this. Okay? And so how would he approach that? Just start reading Colossians. He keeps Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, over and over and over. He hits on Jesus, and then he comes down to this wonderful hymn. Apparently, it's a hymn that says he was in the that Jesus was in the image of the invisible God, and begins talking about him as the agent of creation and and the agent of redemption. And he's. And what Paul is doing is saying he is more than enough. But you see, you 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 highlight that, you see that, partially at least, by repeated words and phrases. Uh, it, it, it's very important. And uh, th there are other ways that sometimes the authors can bring out themes, but uh, I, I really really have found that the chief way is um, the chief way is repeated words and phrases. And if I'm studying a specific passage in any book, I will look for the key words and begin asking myself, okay, or well, that's, that's uh, one reason I use a concordance. I stay within the book out of the conviction that these books are self-contained do they relate to other things? Yes, but they were meant to be understood as a book. Now, the one exception that we'll come to more later is if, if they quote or allude to something in the Old Testament or something else in the New Testament, then it's fair to go there and look. 
But otherwise, I really believe we need to stay within the book. Um, and I'll, I'll have more to say about that later. Okay. Um, also, I had mentioned I had mentioned structure. Um, and since that's somewhat related, not totally, but I wanted to talk a little bit about structure before we move on to um, some other things that I want to talk about. Since structure will be next. Structure is important. Structure is important because everything comes in context. I mean, how often have you heard about how important it is to keep things in context? Or if you haven't, you should have. <laughs> context is important. Something that appears to mean something when it's taken out of context doesn't mean that at all. For instance, I once heard a sermon based on a passage in Colossians 2. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. There are certain things a Christian shouldn't handle, certain things a Christian shouldn't taste, certain things a Christian sh shouldn't touch. Sounds good. Well, sort of. Prob there's a problem. Does anybody know what the problem is? And it all has to do with context. In context, those are the words of the false teachers. The guy was preaching the false teacher's sermon. Now, the false teachers would have done something different from what he did with it. But, but still, you take it out of context and it can appear to mean one thing, and it doesn't mean that at all. In context, the false teachers were saying, you need to be... You need to practice asceticism. You need to beat your body. You need to deny yourself. And that's the way you that's the way you bring your natural passions under control. And Paul says, no, that's worthless. It's Jesus that'll bring it under control when you surrender it to him. Okay. And and we could multiply those il illustrations. And we have to be very careful that we take things in context, and structure helps us. Let the text, this is my first point here under structure, let the text guide you to its structure. Let the text guide you to its structure. Be open to the text. Look for its clues about its own structure. The writers of the Bible weren't writing to confuse us or mystify us. They were writing to communicate. The Spirit of God had inspired them to communicate. Even the book of Revelation is meant to communicate a message. Um, so look look to the book itself for its its structure. It, it'll give you the clues. Now, sometimes, some are easier than others, and we'll come back to that. Saturate, saturate yourself with the text. This is number two. Saturate yourself with the text. Some, some of these things I've already mentioned. Reread and re, read and reread the text. Try reading the text in one sitting, but then go back and slow down. There, there's a place for fast reading. Uh, the, there's a place for fast reading, but there's also a place for slow reading. And um, number three, think about what you read. Think about what you read. Ask questions. Questions like, what's the main point? Because that will help you very often find the structure. What is the main point? How does the author organize his material to make his main point? Okay, here's the main point. How's he organized things to make that point? Why, ask why does the author include what he includes in the order in which he includes it? Why does the author include what he includes 
in the order in which he includes it. Again, think of the author as building a building a case for for the nature of God, for 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 the way life is supposed to be lived, and he's organized in order to make that case. So thinking, trying to think through, why does he include what he includes, and why is he included in the order in which he includes it? How does this section fit with another section? How does this section fit with that section, in other words? How does this section grow out of what came before it? How does this section grow out of what came before it? And how does this section lead to what comes next? So those are the kinds of questions to help you think about it as you're reading it. Number four, and this is where we see repeated words and phrases as helpful in determining structure. Examine repeated words and phrases as clues to the structure. For instance, the book of Genesis repeatedly says, these are the generations. NIV says, this is the account of. And that gives a certain structure, it shows a certain structure in Revelation. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew has two outlines. I have enough trouble working from one. <laughs> Matthew has two. One of them, you can divide the whole book into three parts around the, around the phrase, from this time. It appears twice. And so you have what's before it, you have what's between the two, and then you have what's after it from this time. Another phrase that's used is five, that's used five times. Well, I'll say one thing about, about Matthew that will help with this. Matthew has alternating blocks of narratives and teaching. Narrative teaching, narrative teaching, narrative teaching, all the way through the book. Begins with a narrative, ends with a narrative, and in between you have these, these alternating sections. At the end of the five sections of teaching, it ends with the words, when Jesus finished. When he finished teaching these things, when he finished saying these things, when he finished, okay, that, that's a structural marker. Or in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, Jonah can very simply be divided into two parts. Unfortunately, a, a lot of people only know Jonah was swallowed by a whale or a big fish. But Jonah is quite an incredible book and very applicable. Jonah, and, and it's divided into two using, using, Jonah begins with the words that the, the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, go to Nineveh, that great city, and prophesy against it because their evil has come up before me. And Jonah said, no, thank you. And so he went on a cruise that didn't end well. Well, no, I guess it did. It ended very well, but he ended up inside a fish. The fish spits him out at God's command, and then the word of the Lord comes came to Jonah a second time, saying, go to Nineveh. The whole book can be divided into two parts. In the first one, he's commanded to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to do it. And by the way, the reason he doesn't want to do it is because he hated those people. It wasn't because he was afraid of them. There's not a word in there about him being afraid of them. I would be. They were the Assyrians, nasty people. It wasn't that he was afraid of them. It was that he hated them. He wanted them to be destroyed. If I go and preach, they'll probably respond, and God probably won't do it. I want him to destroy them. And in the second half, he goes and does what he's told to do, and he's the most unhappy, successful preacher in history. <laughs> the whole place converts. And he says, eh, this is this is what I was afraid would happen. 
it's a, it's a, quite a w wonderful book. And it gets at our prejudices. Who do we hate so much that we don't really want to, you know, okay. But anyway, the whole thing can be divided into two parts and you see it in the repeated words and phrases. Number five. Sometimes rather than repeated words and phrases, you have what I would call the flow. Follow the flow of the story. Follow the flow of the story or follow the storyline. We love stories, don't we? I do. I like reading. Uh, I like reading fiction, or historical stories, where it leads you through the whole series of events. We love stories, and we generally find them easy enough to follow. Stories have a storyline that lead a plot. This leads to that. Here's the setting. Here are the characters. Well, the the Bible has we they're historical narratives, but I I don't use story as in fiction. Some people have accused said you're saying it's not true. I'm not. I'm using story as a form. Are you following me? That there's a it's a form. When you read when you read the gospels, the gospels are absolutely true, but they the, and they're biographies, but there's a storyline in them. Okay, uh, we can come back to that at some point if we need to. But but in the Bible, we have a number of stories that have a flow that we can follow. For instance, the Book of Ruth in the Old Testament, just such a delightful, lovely story. Or Esther, not exactly delightful, but it's got a it's got a lot of irony, and uh, I think humor. My my wife sometimes says you've got a sex sense of humor if you, <laughs> if you if you think that's funny. But what else is new? Okay. Or the Gospels or Acts. Okay, those uh, each of those have a a flow to the story that you can follow. Number six, look for other clues. And I've got a bunch of examples. There's probably too many, so I may not go through all of them. But number six, look for other clues. For instance, you read the book of Job. And this is one of the reasons why I say if you can read it in one sitting, if you can't do it in one sitting, in a few as few sittings as possible. What you find in Job is there's an introduction and there's a conclusion that are narratives. In between, there's a series of speeches, a dialogue first between Job and his friends, then Job and a young guy who just pops in and wants to correct everybody, and finally a dialogue between Job and God. Okay, but there's the structure. There's an introduction, there's a conclusion, and in between there are these cycles of speeches where Job speaks in each one of them, and and his dialogue partners speak. Um, that shows the structure. Or in Habakkuk, you may know him as Habakkuk. I've heard it both ways. I call him Habakkuk. Structure of Habakkuk, I, and I, I love Habakkuk. I love Habakkuk because he's a questioner. He starts out with a question and uh, God answers him. He doesn't like the answer. Oy vey, the the question causes me more problems, or the answer causes me more questions than my question did. Okay, so he asks another question. God answers him again. Oy vey, this doesn't seem right. Question, answer, question, answer. And then he ends with one of the mountain peak passages of the Bible, a hymn of faith in chapter three. And the hymn of faith is to say, I don't understand your answers. I don't understand how this can be. 
but I believe in you. And because I believe in you, I know everything's going to turn out right. And I will praise you no matter what happens. It's wonderful. But you see the, the structure of it. Or um, Haggai, another prophet in the Old Testament, Haggai. Haggai, very conveniently, dates his, his messages or oracles. Chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, chapter 2 verse 10, chapter 2, verse 20. Four messages, and each one starts with a date. I gave this message on this date, but that gives you the structure, okay? Lamentations. Five chapters, five poems. The poems are dirges, lamentations. He is crying out in anguish after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of his world as he knew it. We have never, we in the United States have never known such destruction. I'm not saying we never could, but we have never known such destruction in which the entire nation was destroyed, carried off, well, carried off into captivity. And um, Jeremiah laments. Uh, or um, another example, Acts, Book of Acts which is volume two of a two-volume set. Luke and Acts are one set, two volumes. Volume one, the life of Jesus the Messiah. Volume two, the life of the early church. Okay, volumes one and two. Um, and actually, both books have a similar outline. Three-point outline. You can see it in Luke. I'm concentrating here on Acts, but you can see it in Luke and you can see it in Acts. In Acts, the key to understanding, I believe the key to understanding the outline is Acts 8 or 1 8, where Jesus, before he ascends, tells his disciples that they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Three-point outline. And, and as you start going through Acts, chapters 1 through 7, they're in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, they're in Judea and Samaria, which is a wider circle. Jerusalem's the city. Judea and Samaria's the area around it. And then finally, to the ends of the earth. The ex it goes out even farther. And that's in chapters 13 through 28. I like to think of it as it's like throwing... It's like throwing a rock into a pond and watching the ripples. So the dynamic of the book of Acts is growth. It's an, it's an exciting book because of the growth. Um, New Testament letters. New Testament letters in general have a letter form from the first century. There's an introduction, there's a body, and there's a conclusion. Pretty simple. Um, and they're sometimes, especially Paul, will play with that structure a little bit. But still, those are the, that's basically the kind of structure um, he has. Sometimes he adapts it. For instance, in Romans and Ephesians, you have a doctrinal section followed by a practical section. So the first part of Romans, chapters 1 through 11, are doctrinal. Salvation by grace through faith. Then in chapters 12 through the end of the book, you have a practical section in which he shows the practical implications of what he said in the first half, or the first part of the book. You have the same sort of thing in Ephesians. There's a doctrinal section at the beginning that shows what God is doing in Christ in the church. And then in the second half, the, the practical implications. This is how you live it out. 
And there's a, in both cases, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and of Romans and, and Ephesians, chapter 3, uh, verse 1, you have a hinge that shows that it's moving from the doctrinal to the practical. Daniel, I've mentioned Daniel before. Daniel can be outlined in two ways, but in some ways the simplest and the one that stands out the most is the first six chapters are narratives. Stories about Daniel and his friends. Then in chapters 7 through 12, you have visions. Visions that Daniel was given of the future. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is a book of sermons, three sermons. And uh, if you recognize, uh, they begin in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, chapter 4, verse 44, and chapter 27, verse 1. Three sermons that were delivered to the people of Israel before they went into the land the second time. Um, I'll give two more examples that just gives the variety. When you read the book of James in the New Testament, you have what can be called a rondo style. If you're familiar with classical music, rondo means you have um, circulating themes. And in James, rather than a linear progression, it starts here and it goes to here, you have him bringing up certain themes and bringing them up over and over again in, in, in a kind of a circular uh, manner. Book of Revelation. Uh, this is a controversial one to bring up, but I believe that the Book of Revelation is best viewed, the, the structure, as uh, what I would call recapitulation. Um, he's got certain things he's going to say, and he's going to say them over and over again. It's sort of like showing you one picture and then showing you another picture, showing you the same thing from a different angle and then a different angle and a different angle. But it's basically the same ground, but from different points of view. So in Revelation, you have sevens. Seven is uh, one of the things in Revelation is numbers are symbolic. Okay. So you've got seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath. Seven unnamed or unnumbered, not unnamed, but un, uh, unnumbered visions. Um, but that is simply to say there's a whole variety of ways that these books can be structured, but it's important as best we can to try to figure out the structure and to look for clues. Some of the clues are going to be more obvious than others. Number seven. Get outside help. We can work on the structure of these and should for our, for our own good and our own understanding. But but sometimes we will need help. Like uh, like I said last week, we should ask questions, and some and sometimes we will ask questions we don't we can't find an answer for. And it will help us then when we go to outside resources to know exactly what we're looking for. I had this question, I can't answer. I don't know what the answer is. Will this guy help me? Will this one, will this one? And so you're looking for some help on this. So as far as structure, sometimes we can get help from outside resources when we turn to them in the second part of this study. Uh, culture, history, language, um, for instance, in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy on the one hand is the structure is three sermons, but on the other hand, it is people who were somewhat educated in the ancient world in looking at Deuteronomy would have very quickly realized this is a vassal treaty. 
Now, a vassal treaty meant that a stronger power um, forced a treaty on a weaker power. So it'd be sort of like, we're stronger than you, and you're going to make this treaty with us. The advantage to us is we're going to get all kinds of money as tribute. The advantage to you is we're not going to destroy you. Do you want to make a treaty with us? <laughs> okay. Now, that's not what God is saying in Deuteronomy, but it's definitely the stronger power making a treaty with the lesser power. And in this case, all the benefits flow to the lesser. But the, but the people of Israel were the lesser power. And it's, it's a treaty. It's a treaty form. And it helps. This is one case where we can be helped by something from the outside. Okay, questions about any about structure or anything else for that matter. There's still lots to talk about. Um, next week, I want to talk about um, looking for the author's purpose. Figuring out why the author wrote is really important. I want to talk about, I want to come back and emphasize again that we are looking for the author's intended meaning. We are not creating meaning. We are not reading our meaning in, but we're looking for what God inspired the human author to write. And um, and so on. We'll, we'll consider grammar. We'll... Consider the place of how, how about when you have uh, quotations, for instance, in the New Testament, when it quotes or alludes to something in the Old Testament. Um, so we still have lots of things to say. And let me say, this is all without the help of other books. But it doesn't mean that you have to turn your mind off. What I mean is, whatever you know, whatever you already know about history of the period, culture, what's going on in the Bible, what's going on in this book, any anything you know can be brought to bear. Now, we have to be careful to make sure that what we think we know is actually accurate, but, but, but still, we don't just say, I don't know anything. Of course you do, and the more you know, the more you can bring to bear on it, and um, the kinds of questions we ask and the kinds of things that we go through will be repeated when we come to the help of other books, but it will focus us more on what we can learn from them and what we're what we're looking for in them. And I hope that's I hope that's clear. By the way, I am um, I'm enjoying doing this with you immensely. And I hope uh, hope you're gaining ask me questions, whether whether in class or outside of class, um i try to i try to gear everything to help to help everyone start wherever you start and my goal is that you will grow during the during the course of this course and that you'll be increasingly a better interpreter at the end than you were at the beginning and that's not to say you were a bad interpreter okay i'm <laughs> But I believe we can all grow. And um, if sometimes we say, ah, I didn't do very well with that, okay, do better next time. Keep working at it. These are these are skills that you can all of us can con continue to develop and and grow in. Okay, is there anyone here? It was not here when I took attendance at the beginning. Uh, I think I see a couple of people. Um, Jessica V. Yes, Jessica, I see you. Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of you here. And it's Jessica Victor, right? 
Yes, sir. And I still don't remember. Ezer, who are you? On my list. Uh, um, yeah. That's me right here. I missed last class. Okay, I'll get. I I I think I got that. All right, good. Well, let's have a let's have a prayer together, and we'll close out. I, I had one quick question before we close. Oh, sure. And and looking at the letters specifically, and the letters too. What do you say? When when we when we were focusing on letters, okay, we yes, looking, looking at the letters, oftentimes when this is, do, are you do we focus on just that specific letters? Because sometimes you see some repetitive things going on in the letters and the, the same churches, some of the, the the same problems issues. <laughs> She would limit ourselves and not looking at that because sometimes we come into prejudice into that and just focus on that letter and structure itself that it's giving us. <clears throat> Let's come into the context. Well, my, my suggestion would be, and I, I think I've mentioned this before, and I'll come back to it again later, I think, because I think it's an important point. At this point, at this point in the study, in your study of whatever you're studying, whatever letter or whatever book, I would limit myself to the book itself. Um, because again, it's, it's, I'm, it's under the conviction that what that individual or that church needed to hear was, con was contained in that, in that letter. Now, you, you make a good point that sometimes they're dealing with the same issue or a similar issue. Maybe it may not be exactly the same issue. It may be a, a similar issue. But if we start out by understanding what's in the letter, the individual letter itself, then we're in a better position then to go and look at a different different letter and say, yeah, this is the same thing. Or no, it's not quite the same. They're their their issue was a little different um because sometimes things appear to be the same and they're not quite the same right um i, th I think i posed the question to you this is before we got into this and it, it was dealing around timothy and it was dealing with when i had read timothy and it became new to me all again but i remember his history of who he was from his birth and when john when um when uh, paul had had uh, baptized him uh-huh so, um and how that history may play into how paul attacked the letter in addressing timothy yeah i will um yeah you sent me an email on that and i was i i'm still planning on getting back with you on it maybe we'll maybe we'll even talk about it in one of the classes here yeah that's fine um, but uh yeah i had you hadn't dropped off the screen i remember it's like, but it, it's it's when i when i was reading that and studying that it just just focusing on timothy that came in my mind when i started reading the text it just became new again to me based on that reflection of what was written previously in the other text well, let, let me say, say this about it. I, th I think what you're saying is correct, that uh, there is an overlap. And what you're talking about, Timothy, an awful lot of what we know about Timothy comes from First and Second Timothy. There is some beyond that, for instance, in Acts, and, and he appears in some of the letters, some of the other letters. But an, an awful lot of what you were referring to is in First and Second Timothy, and one of the things I've said before, and I may come back to again, 
and we'll, uh, at this point, I want us to concentrate on the the book, and in this case, letter that we're dealing with. Uh, but then beyond that, I, I what I found helpful is you go to you go to the author's other works if he wrote other things. And uh, in the case of Paul, he wrote quite a bit. In the case of Jude, he didn't write anything else we have in our New Testament. Okay. <clears throat> but if if he wrote other things, then there are certain themes that you can go to. But we start out with the book itself. Then we go to the author's other other writings. Then we go to the Testament that it's in. In this case, New Testament, if you were looking at Amos, it'd be the Old Testament. Then you go to the entire Testament that it's in. And then you go to the entire Bible and the entire biblical message. But but I do that because so often I'm afraid what happens is people distort one text. They go to another text, but they haven't really understood either one of the texts. And so one actually distorts the other one. Um, and, and so what I'm teaching has to do with sticking with, uh, with one book at a time. And there is a place for going beyond that. But we have to make sure we understand what this says. And I guess I'll give it for instance. I, I talked about Colossians. Colossians... There was definitely false teaching that was going on that in, in Colossae. It was not, the church has not been taken over by it. That's obvious from what Paul says without going into all of it. Church hadn't been taken over with it, but, but Paul saw it as a danger to them. And it's been very controversial what the teaching was exactly. Some people say, some people historically, some commentators have said it was Gentile paganism, specifically Gnosticism. Don't know how much you know about the Gnostics, but the Gnostics come in full-blown in the second and third centuries. But before that, they, they tried to... They, they tried to attach themselves to Judaism. Then later on, they attached themselves to Christianity. And that's what you see in the second and third century. But their, their basic premise was bodies are bad. Spirit's good. But there are a lot of implications to that. What do you do with Jesus? He had a body. Was his body bad? Well, they went in one of two directions. Some of them said, well, he wasn't real. He was a phantom. You could have seen him and you could have heard him, but he didn't have a real body because bodies are bad. Okay, he was a phantom. They went in another direction. There were other Gnostics that said, well, bodies are bad, but he didn't really have a body. He adopted a man by the name of Jesus at his baptism. The Christ spirit came upon him and stayed with him until he came to the cross and then the Christ spirit left. Okay. Then when it came to us, human beings, followers of Christ, what do we do? Bodies are bad, according to the Gnostics. And again, they went in one of two directions. In one direction, they said, bodies are bad, and so you just need to beat your body. You need to have asceticism. You need to limit your food, sleep on a hard floor, maybe physically beat yourself. Um, okay, bring it under control. The uh, But some went in a different direction, and their direction was bodies are bad, and there's nothing you can do about it. Just let your body go and do what your body naturally wants to do because your spirit has been reborn. I think that was very popular, probably more popular than the first one. But so some people have said that what you see in Colossae 
is Gnosticism. Others said, because there's reference to circumcision, Sabbath, other, other Jewish festivals, and they've said, no, the problem is Judaism, and they try to fit the asceticism and the worship of angels and other stuff into that. I, I'm unconvinced that you can convince that you can put all that into Judaism and you definitely can't put all that into Gnosticism. So my, my own view is that there were some false teachers in Colossae that were trying to influence the church and that they combined Christianity with Judaism, with paganism into a weird mix Um, so I, I, I said all that to say this, if you were to go to passages where Paul talks about Judaizing teachers, and then you were to use that as a, as a kind of a grid or a, something to comment on Colossae, I believe you would end up distorting what was going on in Colossae. That's the reason I... One of the reasons I say just concentrate on the book itself to start with, see what the book tells you. Then you can go outside, first of all, to the author's other works. And then to, and by the way, the reason I say that is, for instance, going back to John, um, John uses life and eternal life a lot in, the, in both the gospel and in first and second John. He uses it a lot. It's one of his key themes. <clears throat> and um, he uses it in a way that is different from the way it's generally used in other parts of the New Testament. I'm not saying it contradicts. I'm not saying it's... I'm just saying it's different. It doesn't contradict them, but... and. Paul, in at least one passage, uses it uses life or eternal life in a similar way. But if you if you go to other passages in the New Testament that talk about eternal life and you read them back into John, you're actually going to end up misunderstanding what John says. So it's best to start with what John says himself and see that before you go to before you go to anything else. Now, did I muddy the waters, make it clear, or something in between? No, that's where that's where I started the text first, and then I went outside after. But um, yeah, you, you gave me some new insight on this whole Gnosticism thing, because I saw that coming up in Timothy, but I was, I, I thought there was other things there. Yeah, there was, there was an early apparently an early form of Gnosticism. It doesn't get full grown until the second and third century in history, but we can see some, some of the beginnings of Gnosticism and some of the, some of the tendencies. Um, I think in the new Testament, you, you see it. Um, I think you see it reflected a lot in John. I think first John, um, First John, he's fighting Gnosticism, for instance. And uh, it may be, yeah, it may be seen in, in Timothy, too. But there's more to be said about that, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, real quick, can you repeat number four under structure? <clears throat> number four. Examine repeated words, examine repeated words and phrases as clues to the structure. Okay, thank you. I will take one more, make one more comment about repeated words and phrases. I just have found that one of the most helpful things because what you find is if you if you for instance you're reading 
Jeremiah and you run into a word that seems seems like it's an important word in this context and you and you can read through all of Jeremiah and look for the word or Jeremiah's a pretty long book you could use a commentary or, or a concordance and just look for the word just in Jeremiah and see how he's using it and it serves as kind of a commentary when 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 you get a sense of how he uses that term or that phrase um it serves as a kind of commentary on the other the other times that it appears and i just have found it very very helpful very helpful Okay, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your word and for the power that it has to change our perception, to give us a vision of you, to help us to come into a deeper, deeper understanding and a deeper relationship to you to see you in all of your all of your glory and all of your majesty and all of your love and holiness and um, father we ask that you would help us to always delight in you and delight in your word because we delight in you in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. I have, a, I have a question before we go. You mentioned two books, how to yes. read the Bible. Um, can you mention those books again? Yeah. Um, how to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Yeah. The authors are Fee, F-E-E, -E, and Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T. Okay, and the second one? And the other one is Introduction to Biblical Interpretation by... Klein with a K. Um, uh, who's the second guy? I'm looking on my shelf. Klein, Hubbard, and... Uh, oh, give me a second. Yeah, Blumberg. Bloomberg. Blumberg. Okay, thank you very much. If, if you were going to read both of them, I would read How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth first. Okay. Okay. Both of them do a great job with introducing you to principles of interpretation, but specifically how you interpret different kinds of literature in the Bible. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everybody. John, I'll be interested sometime to hear about what you did with you? your class. It's been yeah, it's, um, you know, one other comment I was going to make about it was after I went through that, there were some things that I had to go back into the commentaries because I had a few gaps that I didn't really know the answers to. Yeah. And yeah. I found it to be. I'm going to use the word kind of amazing as when I read through those commentaries, how much more I got from them and how they plugged into the scripture and how I could make all the pieces fit and got some insights that I hadn't gotten before because of starting from where I started and then kind of defining the questions I was looking for. And then it was kind of like some aha moments. So yeah, it was, it was very good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's, that that that's great that uh pleases me that you that, that you found it helpful because i have found like you were saying i read commentaries different now differently mm -hmm. and i go to the more as a not exactly an equal because if you have somebody who spent his whole life studying one of the gospels okay he knows more than you do but on more of an equal fit uh, more of an equal footing because i've studied it myself 
And now I look at what he says and I understand what he says better. And sometimes I can even find myself saying, well, I agree with you on that, but I studied this and I think you're off on that. And I, I, I don't want it to make us arrogant at all, but to say it sets up a better chance for dialogue between me and the commentators because now I, I I'm not just going to them for all my information. I already have worked on it and and it so and there's more of a dialogue that can take place. Let me ask you a bit of an abstract question. Um so God will reveal reveal things to you at different times. So you can read the same passage for 10 years and then that's why it's called the living word, right? Okay. No. So you and I both could read a chapter, a book, a passage, um, and the Lord is going to open up different things to you than he will to me simply because I don't have near the knowledge or understanding that you do. So when you're going through this and like I did just with the, just the text and trying to understand and connect all the dots and whatnot. Then when I went to the commentary and plugged in some of the holes, it all made much more sense to me. However, if I do that exact same study in 15 years, I may get something totally different out of that text, correct? Correct. It may not be totally different. It could be totally different. It could be that you're your perception of the text has changed and that you're seeing seeing something you didn't well how do i want to put it? it we always have to be open to the possibility we've misunderstood the text mm -hmm. and later on we're going to understand it but i uh, but also we grow i think about and i think i mentioned this before i don't know if i did or not a week or two ago um, I had I had a professor once upon a time who spoke of the gospel. John said it was like an onion, not that it, mm -hmm. necessarily that it would make you cry, but yeah. that you could peel back layers. Mm -hmm. And my view of John, and you'll see it again later when I you I'm going to use John as an illustration that will uh, bring this out. But I believe John's primary purpose, well, his primary purpose is to promote faith. It's to develop faith in people. I write these things that you may believe, okay? And I believe his first audience, the outer, the outer part of the onion, was um, Greek-speaking Jews. Now that may seem, how could you come <clears throat> up with that? I come up with that because. The people that he wrote primarily for were obviously Jews because they understood a lot of things about the Old Testament and they understood the Jewish festivals and so on. Okay, they're Jews. But he explained Hebrew, Aramaic words to them. What? They're Jews, but they don't understand Aramaic which is the language that was spoken in Palestine. That means they're outside. And at the, in the time of the New Testament, there were more Jews outside of Palestine in the Roman mm -hmm. Empire than inside. So that's, re, that, though, briefly, that's why I've come to the conclusion that these are actually, he's actually evangelizing Hellenistic Jews or Greek-speaking Jews. Um, and yet, and and I I have used Gospel of John evangelistically. I mean I don't know too many Greek speaking Jews today, but yeah. But but I've known plenty of unbelievers, and it and it. John speaks to them, speaks to them, and he says, "I write that you may believe." So, I use it evangelistically, but I have also found that John is wonderful at promoting a deeper faith in people who already have faith. 
a deeper faith in Christians. You're going deeper into it. And going along with what you were saying, sometimes when we come back in 10 years, we say, ah, I was wrong. Sometimes we come back in 10 years and we say, ooh, this is even deeper than what I saw 10 years ago. I'm seeing something I didn't see before. It wasn't that what I saw before wasn't accurate. It was, but now I see more, I think. And I think, you know, just in this conversation, I think is a very good illustration of what you're describing because the way I envision or understand or interpret, I guess, uh, John's primary emphasis is a little bit different than the way you see it, but I think one leads to the other. Uh, you, so yours may be a couple layers deeper than mine. Um, you said that the primary emphasis of what objective he was after was to drive faith. The way I see it is, is he is proving the deity of Christ. And if you do not have a hardened heart, if you do want to believe, then that will build faith because you truly now understand and believe that he is God. See what I mean? Yeah, those, those are not... Um exclusive they're not, they don't exclude each other right agreed i think but we're getting my mind, the, the way i see it is yeah. john is proving deity and you're saying you see it as he's driving faith and it's kind of two perspectives of the same thing is it not yeah and I, if i if i were to expand what i was saying a little bit more i would say he's promoting faith in the deity Mm. of Jesus Christ. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I write these things that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that, uh, and that believing you may have life in his name. Right. And, and there are all kinds of themes there from John repeated words and phrases that he's brought together in his purpose statement. And um, so what we're saying goes along the same lines. We're, we, we would word it differently. We, differently we might emphasize things a little differently but we're coming to the same conclusion and, and that's what i find if if you're devoting yourself to the text and looking to the text to give you clues to its meaning and i am we're going to come to a lot of the same conclusions right exactly exactly um and wasn't one of the things one of the big challenges of the day in john's day um was believing that he was not fully god that he was like this special guy <laughs> gifted guy but he was not fully a deity um of god and that's i always felt like that was one of the main things that john was trying to attack that he was fully god mm -hmm. uh-huh because that I, was I, a big I, challenge of the day correct Yep. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a big challenge then, and it's a big challenge now. Yeah, and I, uh, let me segue off of that into the conversation you had with the gentleman talking about Timothy. Uh, you talked about the Gnosticism, Judaism, all of this stuff that was going on. But at the end of the day, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but at the end of the day, it was all preaching christ insufficient you had to do circumcision or you had to do these other things christ alone was not enough so mm -hmm. does it really matter if it was gnosticism or judaism or whatever they came up with it christ is sufficient that's the point and is that not the point that paul was trying to make yes Don't worry about all that other stuff christ is sufficient Right. I would agree. I think as far as. Uh, how do I want to put it? As I said earlier, some people line up with this is Judaism. He's combating. This is Gnosticism. He's combating. And each one of them would say. That that influences the way you interpret what he's saying. But but in a. Um, but in a deeper level, 
I mean, you're 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 playing my tune actually, but in a, in a deeper level, the issue is: is Jesus enough, or is he not? Right. And whether it's Judaism or Gnosticism, or as I believe, syncretism, where they've combined the two of them, all of them, all of them would be saying he's not enough. That's right. You need X. You yeah. need the law. You mm -hmm. need asceticism you need this the right knowledge and it, it was the wrong knowledge and that's one of his terms by the way he wants them to have the knowledge of god's will mm -hmm. and that sounds like a, a whack at gnosticism but anyway um but it but jesus isn't enough and so so throughout chapters one and two he's going to say jesus is more than enough right and this is the way you live it out as you he'll say in chapter two, verse six, as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to walk in him. And that that's his big theme. He he is Lord. You understood that from Epaphras, who planted the church there. You heard the gospel, and he uses the word truth. You heard the word of truth, the gospel. Francis Schaeffer used to speak of true truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love the I love the phrase, especially in an era where you've got your truth and I got my truth and yeah. relativism. Yeah. And um and Paul emphasizes this is the truth. This isn't an opinion, this isn't just what I think and as opposed to what you think. This is this is the way it is. And John hits that really hard too. He often says the one that was there that saw. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, John is uh wonderful in that way. And uh way back and talk about growth. I was first really introduced to a I mean, I had read the New Testament in high school, even before high school. I was raised raised in a home with a mother in particular that had a daily devotional with me and in high school i read through the bible especially the new testament that was my main concentration so i'd read john but at some point i became introduced to a deeper understanding of it th through a little commentary by merrill c tenney called the gospel of belief and while i think i've grown beyond that book that title's still a wonderful title yeah. for a book on John. Yeah. And um, John promotes belief, and but it goes back to what you were saying. It's belief in the deity of Christ. And that's that was the issue for Greek-speaking Jews. It was the it was the issue for Aramaic-speaking Jews. It was the issue for Gentiles. I mean, and then and now that's that is the issue there. Right. There are all kinds of implications that come out of it. Yeah. And, and you need to follow those implications out. But if you don't get that right, you're not going to get the implications right. 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 Yeah. Um, and you brought up an interesting point tonight as well about Paul being doctrinal and impractical. Uh -huh. And um I'm interested to get back in and read Paul again, but with that lens on, um, because I knew he had both in there, but I saw it more as a mix and a punch bowl as opposed to being two different blocks. So I'm kind of anxious to get back in and see, um, and see if I can pick that out and pinpoint where those hinges are. He is, he, Paul is capable of mixing them. But in, in Romans and in Ephesians, it's very, it's what I call doctrinal, by the way. It's not necessarily the way doctrinal is used today, but it's definitely doctrinal where he's setting out a case for, like in Romans, for salvation by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. And then practically, this is how you live it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Colossians is similar, by the way. It doesn't have that hint, same hinge that those two have, but 
uh, first two chapters I would call doctrinal, the second and the last two chapters practical. But he's also capable of doing other things. For instance, for the longest time, First Thessalonians was a puzzle to me. It was just a puzzle because Paul uses the hinge word that I talked about in chapter 3, verse 2, I believe. But the first, first two chapters are not doctrinal. And it just it blew my circuits. It was like, yeah. how can this be? This is not doctrinal. Uh, and then I realized I was limiting. I was limiting what Paul would do in both cases, both the doctrinal and in first Thessalonians, which is not doctrinal. It's personal. When, when you became a Christian, this is, this is what you experienced. This is the kind of experience you've had in Christ since then. This is the kind of relationship we have in Christ. It's very personal. And I realized that's the background. He's going to come to a practical section, but rather than it, what they needed to hear wasn't just doctrine. Oh, there's some doctrine in it, but what they needed to hear was, this is what you committed your life to, and this is what you've seen happen in your life ever since. And it was very personal. And I realized, ah, oh, this is far more flexible than I had realized. Yeah. Again, Peeling another layer back and seeing a little bit deeper, we continue to grow. Uh huh. Absolutely. So, um, I gotta say, I I gotta commend you on your class. Um, I am truly enjoying this class. I really Good, am. Thank you. Know, I'm getting a lot out of it. Um, the thinking through it and looking at it from different perspectives. Um, yeah, it's it's been very enjoyable. Good. Yeah. I am glad to hear it, and I've enjoyed our dialogue yeah 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 and i'll try to get obadiah to, over to you tomorrow okay good <laughs> you have a blessed night you too right. good night